The United States government gave me $50,000 of free money. Me. And the reason that my government gave me $50,000 of free money is because I was already rich. It was officially a low-income investment housing scheme and I would put in $7,000 a year and at the end of the year the IRS would give me back $7,000 off of my taxes. And for five and a half years I put in $40,000 and they gave me $40,000 back. And then they continued it for another four and a half years and gave me another $30,000 back. And then I owned the property which I sold for about $25,000 after which I had $50,000 of free money which I did absolutely nothing for. And that is how my government works. The only limitation on my deal was that I had to make at least $150,000 a year in order to qualify. Hi, I'm Joel Richardson. Welcome to On Current Events. My guest today is Bill Lewis, former district governor of Toastmasters District 31. Currently Occupy Boston or and a one-time um, math and computer whiz at MIT and Tufts and Stanford and he did um, some seminars in Great Britain I believe and now your, your, your attention is turned to politics and we're going to discuss um, some of your concerns today. Yes, indeedy. Thank you, Bill, and uh, welcome and thank you for, for joining me. Joe? It's a pleasure to be here, man. All right, now, I, I knew you in Toastmasters because um, they were looking for a videographer and I, vol I, I put my paw up and volunteered and, and I came across, and there, there you were. And, and we, we worked on a number of projects together, as I recall. It's a couple of years ago. And, and, and you, you finished your term as district governor, and now you're, um, and you, you, you're all, you had a long career in computers, is that right? That is true. And at, at some um, fairly well-known universities, uh, as I say, MIT, Stanford, Tufts, whatever. Mm -hmm. So and now you and now so so what what attract what what got you thinking about politics? What? <laughs> I am one of those people who, in some sense, lived in that ivory tower. I mean, it wasn't. In a way, it was. In other words, my focus, my concerns were all around the science and the people that I worked with were other computer scientists and other scientists in different realms. And all that we focused on was technologies and images of the mind and just all of these wonderful advanced scientific stuff, beautiful stuff that is making so many things possible for us human beings. But I was, in many respects, totally removed from my society. And I was aware that there were bad things happening, that, that people were getting abused by their society here and there. Uh, and, you know, but not very much. I mean, I, I certainly didn't pay attention to it. Uh, when the civil rights movements came, uh, we were going like, yes, finally, this is the right thing, you know. Our, 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 Black fellow citizens have achieved equal rights in society. Yes, we have the America that we always promised that we were. And, and I believed it. And then I came to realize more and more that actually there are some real problems here. And um, when Occupy Oof. Boston started, I went down there, actually gave a speech at the Federal Reserve Bank, then walked across the street and talked to people there and realized that they were saying the same things that I've always been saying, except they were getting international attention. And so I stayed. And the longer I stayed, the more I realized that things are worse and worse and ever worse than I thought they were. Well, give me an idea. What are you, like maybe one or two of your main concerns uh, or issues that you, 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 you're unhappy with? So fundamentally, I want 
democracy. The will of the people be done. I want you and me and everybody else in the entire nation, and for that matter, in some extended sense, the entire world, I want everybody to have full participation in what runs their society. And of course, what happens in the United States is you and I have virtually no say in what happens in America now. I mean, the Princeton Review just came out with that statement, America is no longer a democracy, it is run by its corporations. And we look at all of these studies all saying the same thing, which is, it doesn't matter what the bottom 99% think, what gets done is what the top 1% wants. The typical example is exactly my point with, with tax breaks. Um, right now, I am on a campaign. My objective is to get the next governor of Massachusetts to stand up and say that we should stop giving away free money to rich people and corporations. I want to end corporate welfare. And I think it's something that the governor actually had a real say in. So I, I made myself a little button here to emphasize my point. There we go. I'm rich. I can afford to pay my taxes. And just like that example I gave you when we started the program, I can afford to pay my taxes. At my peak, I made a quarter million dollars a year. And so $5,000 a year on tax breaks on that low-income housing scheme made no difference to my life at all. It didn't change where I lived, what car I drove, how much I ate, where I went on vacation. It didn't change anything except a little number in my bank book. And it wasn't even a big number in my bank book. because I made a quarter million dollars a year. I had a big bank book. And so $5,000 meant nothing to me. If I had been a slightly more intelligent investor, I would be a very wealthy man today. But my point is that I don't need help. As an entrepreneur, what I want from my government is good infrastructure, a clear set of rules, and then a level playing field so that I can compete against somebody else. I want to spend my time building beautiful, wonderful computer science programs or, or classes or whatever I do. I want to spend my time thinking about my area of expertise. I don't want to screw with taxes. I don't even want to think about that stuff. It makes no difference to my life. And yet, we laid off a teacher somewhere in this country so that I could get my tax break. So you, f you feel the government designs the system deliberately to favor the 1%. Is, is it, am I hearing you correctly? You are absolutely hearing me correctly. When I was, one of the percent, when I was part of that 1%, yeah. Can you give me some, some more examples besides that, um, oh. the tax thing? Yes, so, um, of course, just on, on taxes in general, we know that somewhere around half of all tax expenditures are some type of subsidy or tax break for the wealthiest 10% of our population. So, in other words, if people actually paid the taxes they officially owe, if there weren't loopholes, if there weren't caps, if there weren't exceptions, mm -hmm. we would have our, our governmental revenues would be twice what they are today. That is how much is just being given away to people like me who don't even use it. We just leave it in a bank, it becomes investment. Okay, now, um, what do you say to people who say, well, you know, the government makes these caps or these breaks, but they have good reasons. They, when they make these, these tax breaks, um, they're, they're trying to, the goal is to try and help probably say some group of, of the population and then s for some reason the the tax break spills over to other people 
and they get to take advantage of it too. What, what about something like that? Okay, so, so for example, um, there is a tax break uh, designed for uh, small insurance companies in rural areas, I think in Appalachia, and the gist of the thing is you'll be a tax-free corporation, um, and the limitation is you can take in no more than $100,000 in, in revenue, so that it's easier for you to deal with very rural farmers who have very big troubles getting insurance. Okay, seems like a great idea, nice, innocent little thing. And then uh, Peter Kellogg, very famous, wealthy man, realized that as a tax-exempt corporation, it didn't matter how much money it took in, he could invest in the corporation, and any money he invested it could then be invested again tax-free. And so he's making, uh, basically laundering $100 million a year, just straight out of government coffers into his pocket because now he's a tax-exempt corporation. So the examples that you gave happen all the time. Okay. Um, okay. So now, one one thing I've I've always felt in life is that the problem with rules and regulations is no matter how careful you are in writing them, there will be always always be some way to finagle them or manipulate them in in, in the direction that they weren't originally intended. Mm -hmm. How how do you get around that? Well. Complication is the, 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 the stepchild of the wealthy. The more complicated things are for regular people to manip maneuver, the more easy it is for us to be manipulated. So for example, if our tax code read as follows, how much did you make? Send in this much. Or how much did you make? Send it in. <laughs> now, but seriously, if the tax code was that simple, if it was like, how much did you make? Send in this much, no exceptions. Right. If you want a flat to tax, it, if it doesn't it, have to be flat. Wasn't uh, the was, point is yeah. if it's simple. If there are no loopholes, if there are no exceptions, it. there's no way to get around it. If it's just out there in the open and everybody is staring at it, that's a good thing. It's harder to cheat. The more complicated you make it, the more loopholes you add to it, it becomes easier and easier to cheat. Okay, this, uh, this reminds me of uh, what, when we were discussing, a, when I was in finance class, and they were discussing um, the, 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 the code that they have for that. The problem with that is that when you write a simple rule, with, without even questioning, somebody's going to come up and say, hey, I'm a special circumstance of that rule. You got you got to add this you got to add this code to it, and then and then somebody else will say, "So am I." You got to add this and this and this, and that's how it gets so complex. Absolutely. And how do they get those advantages? Of course, they buy out our legislators. I mean, basically, with Citizens United, we have said corporations are now legally allowed to bribe our legislators, and it, and of course, the corporations pay for both sides. It's not like they're the Democrat who's different from a Republican for the most part. The, we like to call them Republicrats. Do the same thing. They're all, so many of them are basically bought out by corporate power. How do they get away with, I don't, what, what, what baffles me, and you know, I must be naive, but if these politicians are really um, being bought out by the big corporations, how do they get reelected? There are lots of good theories on that. The, the, the basic concept that I have read, which makes, which makes sense to me, is that to a huge degree, we as voters are swayed very much by what we call uh, social issues. And to a huge degree, we can be swayed on social issues, and behind our backs, 
they pick our wallets clean. The example, the example that I'm most familiar with is Kansas. You know, once a great popular state, oh my God, the farmers ran Kansas. They had state banks, they had their, their, their state utilities, and it worked beautifully for them. But bit by bit, politicians would bring up, you know, social wedge issues. Abortion, religion in school, you name it. Vote for me, I will allow our children to, to have prayer in school, the principal will be allowed to, you know, read. You know, when I was a kid, every morning, you know, we would uh, do the Lord's Prayer. Right. And so, you come out of the politician, you say, I am, I am for God. Vote for me. And by the way, I'm selling the public utilities to Wall Street, which is exactly what happened in Kansas. And no surprise, we're all feet ran right into the ground. And farmers' rights eroded and eroded. It is now illegal to photograph agriculture in many of our states because they don't want us to know. And they, that is not what the people of those states want. The farmers that I know are proud of being farmers. They want people to know how they are raising their animals and how they're raising their crops. But when you get the giant corporations, big ag and all of that stuff, they find ways to shut out the little farmers. There's hardly any little farmers left in this country. It's all big ag. And it all comes from the same thing, which is the very, very wealthy have found ways to manipulate the rules, to exclude the little guys, and all of a sudden their farms are under mortgage. How do their farms become under mortgage and then they lose them? Okay, well, I guess what I would say to that is the advantage of the big corporation. Like I've heard this, the, same, the same argument about Walmart. Hey, you got a big, huge corporation that is, has a reputation, whether it's deserved or not, of claiming, of underpaying its workers. And yet, yet it's, it's popular and everybody goes there. And the, 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 the smaller companies or the mom and pop outfit gets bought out and loses, loses their business. And my, my, argument, my argument in favor of Walmart, playing the devil's advocate here with you, so, um, is that the people go to Walmart because they want to go to Walmart. They prefer it to the mom and pop. Because, and the reason for that is more variety and lower prices. So if they can if they can get lower prices and more variety at Walmart, you know, mom and pop, it's it's, it's basic competition, the law of competition. The the people go to the place where they can get the best deal. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what do you say? I mean that to me that's why the mom and pops are going out because um, they aren't offering. A service or a product that can compete with what Walmart's offering. That is an amazingly complicated issue that you bring up because it involves everything, you know, from, from uh, fundamental human rights, worker rights, all that kind of stuff, to the manipulation of the system, to the use of, of you know, loan and lever mortgage as leverage, to, to the very concept of money. I mean, this stuff, this stuff, just threw this around, did it? When I threw the dollars in the air, right. $20 bills, did that do anything to you sort of? Yeah, yeah, I was thinking, boy, I hope I don't have to pick these up after the show. Because, <laughs> I mean, at some level, it's just a piece of paper. And, you know, at the same time, there's, to me, there's an emotional attachment that, that I can't quite explain. And, you uh -huh. know, it did sort of like do something to me, to like, okay, that's... Well, well my, my attitude to this money is, money in itself doesn't do you any good. It's when you spend it, that it's worth something. So, which is kind of paradoxical, because that means it's not worth anything until you get rid of it. But if you know what I mean, I mean, if, if I just have money in a bank account, so what? If I don't 
spend it on a nice house or a nice car or a vacation or something, it's useless. It is, it is a weird thing. What is money? And so we can go on for that forever, but I'd actually prefer not to. I'd like to change the subject a little bit. All right. And um, tell, I wanted to tell you about my summer vacation. Your summer vacation. All right. Yeah, we're, so, we're at the end of summer here. It's uh, Actually, it's, it's Labor Day today. It is. So it is officially the end of summer. Woohoo! All right. Labor Day. Oh, my God. The eight-hour work day, the 40-hour week. People died so that we could have a 40-hour work week. And then they, they created the uh, exempt status, and, and then it all went away, right? Oh, it is all so... The world is, in my opinion, basically a, a battle between the very, very powerful and everybody else. And if we look through history, I mean, all of history is about what the very, very powerful are doing and how they're getting everybody else to go to war with each other. You know, German farm boys really didn't want to go over and kill French farm boys or Russian farm boys, and yet, their leaders inspired them for nationalhood and, and, and mother Germany or uh, to go kill people. They, our leaders inspired us to kill other people because why? Did those German farm boys get anything from going out and killing those Russian farm boys? Did our soldiers get anything from killing, they think that we killed a million Iraqis? Some crazy number uh, of people died because, why? They brought down the Trump Towers? No, no, Iraq. Oh, um, I, I don't know, I, I mean, I know that's when we, when we started going into Iraq was, was when, um, was when the, the the September 11th attack, and then Bush got there and said, you know, we, we have to do something. And so a bunch of Saudi Arabians fly airplanes into American buildings, and so we invade Iraq. That, that's... I, I, I guess he was, uh, you know, and excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm not really up on my current events, but I guess he was, he was looking for Al-Qaeda. So, there it is. Isn't that interesting? So, the most important political events of the world, uh, you and I, I don't know that much about it. Right. I just know that I have nothing against no Iraqi uh, kid who's trying to protect his people, his, his family, his country. I don't want to be over there killing people. Though they never did anything to me, never did anything to anyone I know. Why are we killing them? And yet it you happens know, again. I'm not. I'm not a big fan of war either. I don't. I don't understand war. I don't understand why someone would want to. I don't understand why a country would want to invade another country. Why don't they just be happy with their own country? They uh, are. They're leaders know. at the very top. But the, get them riled up, and the, we see this again and again. Our leaders get us riled up. Oh, we have to go take care of them Iraqis. Oh, it's and just. Fill in the blank. Why did we invade Panama? Why did we invade Granada? Why did we? I, I, I guess I guess um, the reasoning is kind. Of, it's kind of like it's like either you're if you don't have an offense, um, sometimes an offense is the best defense. Uh, if if you if if you're not pushing forward, someone's going to be pushing on you. It's kind of unfortunately that's kind of the world we live in, but. Yeah, it, it should be. It, there should be a better way that people realize. You know, hey, maybe, maybe if neither one of us pushes on each other, uh, we might be happier. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're, we're we're striving towards that as a society, but we're we seem to be a long way from it. It is profitable to have wars. People get money and power off of it, and that's where they happen. And you know, when I was in high school, I played football. I wasn't good enough. I was a lineman, if you can believe that. All right. So, so I did not even make it into a freshman game. But I loved it. 
Mm. Just getting out there and hitting other guys as hard as you could, tackling them. Yeah, I can do this. Best thing in my life was tackling the biggest guy on our team, like twice as big as I was, but I could bring him down. Yes, I am a man. I understand that. I was, I joined Army ROTC when I went to college. And I felt that feeling of, of pride in my nation and desire to secure the, 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 the um, liberties that, that, that we are promised in our Constitution. And then I realized that that isn't what we were doing. And I, as a Toastmaster, go on to bases, military bases, because they have Toastmasters clubs there, and I talk about the same set of fundamental issues that we're talking about right now. And uniformly, the responses that I get from the officers there is, we join the military because we love and want to protect our country. We are being used to kill poor, innocent kids, people all over the world for what our presidents describe always as American corporate interests. That's always what they say. It's not for America. It's not for Americans. It's always American corporate interests. They usually don't say the corporate. They just say American interests. But it is never in my interest or your interest as a citizen that we go to war. It is in the interest of our mightiest and most powerful. Okay, well, Bill, um, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but it's been it's been very interesting talking to you. You 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 raise up a lot of a lot of questions that you know. Uh, yeah, we should we should be thinking about these questions, and um, so I thank you for um, um, initiating and encouraging the dialogue. And I encourage the viewer to um, consider some of these questions and, and come up with your own responses. Come up. How, how do you answer these questions? What, what do you say about the, all these issues that, that Bill is, is so concerned about? So thank you. Um, once again, this is on current events. This is not my normal track show. This is a current events show. And... Um, Thank you, Bill, and uh, see you next time.